You are seven years old when a grown man screams at you, spitting knives from crooked purple lips. Go home, you effing packy. You are confused because the ethnic slur is inaccurate. You realize too young that races fail geography, but that their epithets and perverted patriotism can still shatter moments of your childhood. You are the last to know that everyone else sees you as other. You keep your eyes on your paper and study and do well and stay quiet and obey. You get patted on the head and told you're one of the good ones. You're a model until you aren't. Because those manners you once minded and that tongue you once bit won't be held back anymore. Can't be. And what they think is rebellion is in truth survival. Because if you stay silent one second longer, the anger surging through your blood will engulf you in flames. So you snatch their words from the air. Terrorist, raghead, sand nigger, and burn them like kindling and rub the embers onto your skin, a sacrilege, a benediction. For the girl you once were, for the girl you are becoming, the one who doesn't ask to be recognized but demands to be known. The one who presses into our fears to speak out, to stand up, to live, anything else is death. The one who learns that sometimes the enemy is a smiling neighbor, too ashamed to reveal herself except behind the dark curtain of the ballot box. Sometimes your enemy is a friend. You are tired of fighting for your name and tired of the eternal question, where are you really from? You persist. Because your name is who you are, you weep for a land built on the backs of your black and brown brothers and sisters and soaked in their blood. You claim your joy. You lay your roots, blood and bone, fire and ash. And in this land of the free and the home of the brave, you plant yourself like a flag. A poem by Samira Ahmed. The title of the poem is On Being American, and it's from a collection, Ink Knows No Borders, Poems of the Immigrant and Refugee Experience, uh, that has been published by Seven Stories Press. Good evening. My name is Charles Carr, and welcome to Philly Loves Poetry, a collaborative uh, program from the Moonstone Arts Center of Philadelphia and Philly Chem. The focus of our show is to give our audiences, both here and you as viewers, the experience of the rich culture of poetry in the city of Philadelphia. And to understand that in the city of Philadelphia, there are over 50 different organizations that somehow promote the love of poetry, either through having poetry readings each week, which Moonstone does, uh, having special poetry events throughout the, the year uh, that run poetry workshops for poets of all ages and all stages of development and publish books of poems, uh, both chapbooks and full length and, and poetry journals. Moonstone itself is a publisher of bo uh, books of poems. Uh, so tonight we have the second in a series of uh, programs this year on Philly Loves Poetry, and that, which is the title is, is Generations of Philadelphia Poets. And tonight we really have an extraordinary and excellent uh, guest uh, here to join me uh, for this show, and I think we're really very, very fortunate to have them. Uh, to my far right is Octavia McBride Ahabe. Uh, Octavia works presently in human relations with the context of global inequality. Her poetry collections include Assuming Voices, Where My Birthmark Dances, and most recently, Praise Song for the Gravediggers. Octavia's work has appeared in numerous journals and anthologies, including Rigorous, For Harriet, Raising Lily Ledbetter, Women Poets Occupy the Workplace, Yellow Medicine, <clears throat> Badalasha Poetry Exchange, Damazine, a literary journal of the Muslim world, Fingernails Across the Chalkboard, Poetry and Pose for HIV AIDS from the Black Diaspora, Under Our Skin, Literature of Breast Cancer, Sea Breeze, a journal of contemporary Liberian writing. The Journal of the National Medical Association, Art and Medicine, International Court, Poetry and Faces of Americas, and the Beloit Poetry Journal. So very welcome. Thank you. And next to her is her daughter, Sojourner. Sojourner was born in uh, the Ivory Coast to an American mother and father. 
Sojourner uh, writes stories about African diaspora identities and the eternal question of home and belonging. Sojourner's poems have been published or are forthcoming in The Atlantic, The Academy of American Poets, Poem a Day, Muscle Magazine for Harriet, Winter Tangerine Review, Apiary Magazine, and elsewhere. In 2013, Sojourner served as National Student Poet, the nation's highest honor for young poets presenting original work. Sojourner was invited to the White House by former First Lady Michelle Obama to garner her award. Sojourner is a graduate of the Stanford University where she undertook four years of rigorous study within the African American Studies program. Sojourner is a recipient of the Dow Fellowship and her debut poetry chapbook, Reporting from the Belly of the Night, was released in August 2017. Sojourner believes that not in the boat that floated her here, but what she'll do with the water. Well, welcome, both of you. Thank you. So I really want to start out um, with a, a very interesting quote that I picked up from a video that I uh, saw, you know, that you gave. It was, it was very inspirational. He said, I don't want to preach. I want to serve. And you kind of, this is your perspective on poetry. Can you kind of expand on that uh, statement? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess particularly that particular quote came sort of like from um, that space of being a national student poet and part of being a part of that program. Um, I had to take on a year-long service project in which I interacted with different various communities um, throughout the United States via poetry. So whether that was in classrooms, libraries, um, I even worked with elderly people, um, particularly Alzheimer's patients, mm -hmm. um, using poetry in memory. So very different kinds of communities. Um, and ultimately, when you're going into many of these communities, poetry isn't often something that people have really encountered outside of really a classroom setting and it's often not something that was something that people were excited about particularly because of the way that poetry has just kind of been taught mm -hmm. um, throughout time in classrooms um, so for me it was really important to sort of like disarm poetry and not sort of come in thinking I was offering anyone anything mm -hmm. but really trying to see sort of all the gifts and treasures and stories that people were already carrying in these really particular spaces and my job was then to sort of like mediate the space and not to tell anyone how they were meant to feel or what they should be writing mm -hmm. or how they should be writing but really just giving them the tools they need um, to express their voice. Well, that's exciting and out of that came a collection of, of poems? Not that particular project, uh -huh. um, but yes, I am. I have currently been working on a new uh -huh. collection of poems, and the one that was released in 2017 okay. um, was a separate project. Yeah, it program. must have been an amazing experience to go to the White House Definitely. to meet the First Lady. Yeah, for Michelle sure. Michelle Obama. <laughs> Tell me about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so again, the National Student Poets Program, there's five poets, and each poet represents a distinct region of the United States. So at the time, I was going to boarding school in Michigan, so I was considered the Midwest region. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were all invited, and we you know, flew into D.C. It, uh, all the festiv festivities kind of coincided with the National Book Festival that was happening. So we had um, a ceremony there, and then Michelle Obama invited us to the White House for an official pinning ceremony mm -hmm. to sort of commemorate the beginning of our service, our year of service. Um, and so she hosted us um, in the diplomatic room and wow. um, she read some of our poems in advance. And she read some. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was really cool. She's very generous, very generous lady. Um, you know, spent a lot of her time with her talking about the poems, about our year of service, what we were looking forward to, gave us advice. Um, it was a really special moment. I'll bet you. Yeah. That's really great. Yeah. So Octavia, here yeah. you have this wonderful <laughs> daughter uh, uh, that really doesn't fall far from your, your mm -hmm. grace, uh, but you're a, a teacher. Mm -hmm. you're, you teach elementary school, yes. right? Yes. And, and your relationship, you know, to children in poetry, how is that, how do you express that? Can you talk about that? Yeah, well, <clears> um, <throat> I teach third grade primarily, and um, each week we have a poem of the week. So my kids can tell you, you know, Walt Whitman, Rita Dove, Langston mm -hmm. Hughes, um, the gamut. Um, I want poetry when they first meet it to be an exciting experience, because like Sadrina was saying, a lot of time 
when kids uh, meet poetry is not, is not as, as early as third grade, it's much later, and it's not a pleasant experience. Mm -hmm. So with a poem, we may act it out, we may illustrate it, um, there's always a recitation. Um, we, uh, a lot of times we like to in invite poets from our community, like you said, Philly is so rich, but especially young dynamic poet poets, right. so they can see that you know poets um, are amongst them and that they are indeed poets themselves, so they mm -hmm. create as well. So um, it's just something that is just you sort of uh, weaved throughout our, uh, our classroom curriculum. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> you're originally from Philadelphia, I'm from correct? Philly, right? And then West you Philly. went to uh, you know, Ivory Coast yes. and you returned with yes. this wonderful young lady. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about your attachment to Philadelphia as a, as a poet. Well, I mean, I had a phenomenal experience. I'm from Overbrook. Okay. And I went to Overbrook Elementary, and I knew anybody of my who went there during the 70s, um, they know of a woman named Rose Martin, and a uh, sixth grade teacher, but who had a really uh, huge passion for poetry. And she organized uh, this thing she called the Black Poetry Pomerama. Mm -hmm. So she organized with the teachers within Overbrook Elementary School that each child would learn a series of poems. And then April, we had this big presentation at the Overbrook High School. So if you can imagine like a neighborhood, 200, 250 families, and they're learning poetry, and it mm -hmm. was mainly black poets. Uh -huh. And so from elementary school, you were aware very much of, um, you know, of the Langston Hughes and Margaret Walker and Nikki Giovanni. I mean, it, it just ran the gamut. And, um, and so you came through poetry through, through that, and your parents were so involved because I, I mean, I have a, um, one poem I had to, to learn was The Negro Mother by Langston Hughes. And my mother had to help me with that poem. That was a very long one poem. poem yeah. And my mom passed from, um, she had Alzheimer's. She couldn't recognize us, but in the end, she could still memorize that poem. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, just so we, we just appreciate the power of poetry. And, uh -huh. and I just owe so much to this fabulous woman, Rose Martin, who just infused a whole community you know, in the early 70s of poetry. You know? I, I read when I was, you know, uh, researching both of you, but yeah. something, uh, an interview you gave where there, somebody quoted Camus mm. in terms of um, what Camus had said about the, the, the teacher that he felt that was so instrumental in his life. Can you yeah. just share that with us? Yeah, now when I was, I taught in the Ivory Coast at the International uh -huh. School of, um, of Abidjan, mm -hmm. fourth grade. And um, at the end of the year, a parent uh, gave me a copy of the letter that Camus wrote, gave his fourth grade teacher uh -huh. after Camus received the Nobel Prize for Literature. And he said, you know, at that moment, you know, he was thinking of that person who inspired him the most, mm -hmm. and that was that elementary teacher. Mm -hmm. And that parent was just saying, thanking me to say, you know, yeah. you were, had an incredible... Yeah impact on my child. But, I, mean, but I have to believe there are children who you have taught that are saying the same thing about you. You know. My kids and, though we're good. <laughs> and yeah. and, and yeah. you told me, but Larry also told me that you used to bring <laughs> Sojourner mm -hmm. when she was what whatever Seven, and into yes. the community yeah, of poets yeah. here in Philadelphia. Right. And I think that's that's really wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, you know one one of the wonderful things about Moonstone in this this event that they do every year called Poetry Inc. I mm -hmm. think you've heard of it. Yeah. This is an anthology that's put together of almost a hundred poets mm -hmm. and submissions. But there are young people, they get an opportunity to publish in this collection. And, and young people, when I say young people, middle schoolers, maybe high schoolers, mm -hmm. that have not really been heard, but they, they have the opportunity to come and to read right. a poem in this series. And mm -hmm. I think that that's really what we should be really about. Right is bringing out these great young voices like Sojourner mm -hmm. and so many others. Yes. So, um, so where, do you, where do you draw your inspiration? I know your mom has been your inspiration, but in mm -hmm. terms of your art and where you are right now with your poetry. 
Yeah, definitely. So first and foremost, I think it really began like in my home. You mm -hmm. were just saying um, my mom was, and my grandmother, there's been like a sort of like a matrilineal kind of like legacy of poetry throughout my family. Mm -hmm. So my grandmother like sort of was, was reared on these like Southern poets. And so she memorized many, many poems throughout her lifetime and shared that love of poetry with my mother who then that shared that love with me. So as young as I can remember, I, I can just recall my mom reading me poems in view of bedtime stories. So like Langston Hughes, Maya Angelou, Nikki Giovanni, like wow. those were just like, their power and their presence were like always in my home, like mm -hmm. sending me to bed. Um, you know, I was rising with them. It was just like there. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 2002, when I was still living in the Ivory Coast, I was about like six or seven, the Civil War was about to start and all the American citizens were essentially asked to evacuate. So mm -hmm. that's when me and my family um, relocated back to Philadelphia, which is my mother's hometown. Um, and that's really sort of what started and inspired um, my poetry practice. I was sort of in this in-between space of trying to figure out what like what I was and who I was. Was mm -hmm. I American? Was I Ivorian? Um, I was, you know, now going to public school like in Philadelphia and all these sort of like questions started to emerge like from my fellow students about my identity. Mm -hmm. and, um, and some of the questions felt very sort of like hurtful because I wasn't able to really answer them and there wasn't mm -hmm. really a, cl a clear mm -hmm. answer. Um, and then also sort of that issue of feeling like you didn't belong and being displaced in mm -hmm. this very traumatic way of having to, you know, be uprooted and leave um, without, you know, knowing if you were ever going to go, go back. Um, and so poetry really became that place where I could kind of address mm -hmm. those things um, and give language to those things that didn't have language anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, that was sort of my first, I guess, experience with poetry. Right. You know, I read something when it, in, in some pieces on you and some things you said about when you were in elementary school yeah. that on dress down day, uh, you know, everybody had their costume or whatever they wanted to wear mm -hmm. called dress down. But you persisted in really coming dressed in, you know, that's a representation of you as a child from, from Africa. Right. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, for me, I guess like particularly because like my mother was a really big part of kind of allowing me to remember the Ivorian elements of like my history. So whether mm -hmm. that was like the writers that she'd read me like or the food that we would eat or that she would prepare in our home, that was something that was like actively preserved like right. by my mom. Um, and it was something that like I was really proud of and something I really missed once I left Cote d'Ivoire. Um, so when I came to the United States, it was sort of like there was no question that those things had value and that they were things that I loved and things that I then wanted to share with mm -hmm. other people. But um, when you're, you know, a young kid, you know, kids are very kind of like ignorant about those things. Right. And there's particular kinds of stereotypes they have about, you know, Africa is just like one big country and like not this <laughs> place that is like full of like, you know, 54 plus right. countries with distinct cultures and languages and that kind of thing. So for me, I didn't realize that that was the perception because I'd always been sort of on the other side of it, living it. Um, so when I was met with that, it was very kind of like hard to yeah. deal with. Um, but I think poetry really allowed me to follow that assertion of self and to kind of, um, affirm that value yeah, in those things, yeah. that makes sense. I think that's a very great story, you know, because yeah. America has been about the melting pot, and sometimes the yeah. melting pot means I, you have to be like us, you know, right. whoever the us is. Yeah. And, but the, the really greatness is that when we find out about other people's experience and cultures, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the magic of, you know, mm -hmm. the country. So for you to do that, <laughs> right. I think that that's really cool, that's really wonderful, <laughs> and we need more of that. Thank In you. fact, you know, I, and I want to put a little plug that something that Moonstone is doing that Larry has worked on, Larry and Robin, uh, it's called We Are South Philadelphia. Mm. And what is going to be a demonstration of all the cultures that now make up South Philadelphia, mm. and, and Asian, African, you know, traditional things we know, Italians, Polish, Irish, but, uh, Cambodian, Indonesian, mm. and even some populations we don't know. And uh, next August, there's going to be a coming together for a festival where there's going to be this demonstration, you know, of mm -hmm. this is who we are. Mm -hmm. This is who we are. This is our culture. Mm -hmm. 
And I just think that's a, a great experience in a community, and I think that strengthens the community. I want to get back to poetry and talk about, you know, your discipline on poetry. Here you mm -hmm. are, a teacher, your mother, et cetera. What, how, how do you find time, and what is your discipline as far as your poetry writing? Well, um, I think it's important to carve out some time. It's not always the same time, mm -hmm. but, but some time, some quiet, private time. Um, thankfully, uh, Sojourner and I are fortunate that we're in this great uh, space. Um, I was telling you earlier that we moved down to, to the Pelt West Pelton uh, Village area, and we're actually in a space that is just for artists. It's 21 units, wow. and it's just artists, and art, trying to keep artists in a community that's rapidly oh. gentrifying. Uh -huh. So it's a special space. So it, the, the physical space, how it's um, laid out, especially the workspace, um, you know, really is uh, sort of compelling and inviting for you to create your work. But a lot of times, too, I create my work um, also with my young students. You know, uh -huh. when they're writing, and I ask them, can I join you? Can I start out? Of course, I mean, I have to be monitoring them and yeah. looking at But sometimes I say, can I have five or ten yeah. minutes with you? Uh -huh. And I really value that time, and, sure. I'm, and I'm actively trying to create something. But, um, but to, 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 uh, to give yourself, um, whether it's weekly, whether it's throughout the week, because we were caregivers of elderly, our, our parents, um, my own students, um, it's not always an exact schedule, but you have to give. You have to be committed to giving yourself mm. some time to be creative. Sure. You're right. And that, and to involve yourself. I love the space I'm in, to be around a community of, of writers and other artists where you can share because that community is so important. You know that that communal aspect. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I didn't know about that. Yeah. What, what but, is yes. it called? Is it a name? There's a name about it? people can find more out about that. Yes, or? the um, the People's Emergency Center saw oh, a okay. need to keep artists in the community because the ah. rents were rapidly. So uh -huh. they so they um, uh, partner with other organizations and they. It's a beautiful. That's yeah, yeah. And Sojourner, as far as your discipline and your of you uh, writing your poems and. Do you dedicate specific time, or are there, are there mm. larger times when you say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this? Yeah. Uh, how, tell us about your discipline. Totally. Um, I'm someone who like really loves structure, so I have to have something like to keep me accountable. Um, a lot of my sort of serious writing sort of arise like when I was in like high school and mm -hmm. college. Like I went to a performing arts high school in Erlaken, and I studied creative writing there. So there was a very particular like structure around writing. Like everyone within the major was like in a you know few workshops. There was an expectation that you were like producing work, that you were going to workshop other people's work and turn in revisions. Um, so that was like a really kind of like transformative experience to have as a young writer and to begin developing a writing process. And that's something that definitely sort of, I, you know, followed into my college years, um, pursued writing, you know, in workshops on the college level as well. And now that I'm sort of on the other side, you know, on the postgraduate side, I'm sort of trying to figure out what a writing ritual looks like, mm -hmm. especially now that, you know, I'm starting to work um, and, you know, you have other responsibilities. Right. Um, so for me, it's been really helpful to dedicate a particular amount of time mm -hmm. and a particular time of day to write mm -hmm. um, and to make sure that I have, like, no other distractions. I personally don't like to, you know, have the Internet. If possible, mm -hmm. I like to write in a notebook just so I'm not, like, in front of a screen. Right. Um, so little things like that, like, help me to stay accountable. Right, right. So, if I was to ask you right now, mm -hmm. the kind of the existential <laughs> predicament, what is kind of seeping, bleeding into your into your poems? You feel right now. Mm, right now, I feel like I'm really being called by my ancestor, my namesake, Sojourner mm -hmm. Truth. Um, like for those of you who aren't familiar, like Sojourner Truth was an African American abolitionist um, from the 19th century, and she had this incredible collection of photo portraits that she had taken of herself throughout her lifetime. Um, and she was illiterate, so she never learned how to read or write. Mm -hmm. And she was um, enslaved in the North, which was a very particular kind of an enslaved upbringing that we often don't really think about or consider black enslaved people in states like New York, which is where she was from. Um, and recently, I discovered her photographs, which were called carte de visites. Mm -hmm. And they essentially democratized, this kind of photo photography democratized photography prior to this mode 
everyone, not everyone could have photos taken of them for very cheap. Mm -hmm. um, but after Carte de Visite, it, it became very accessible. So people like Sojourner Truth were able to sort of like disseminate their image and their message mm -hmm. really easily. Um, and so I'm interested in her photographs and writing towards the photographs because I think that she was doing something um, with this like visual medium that she wasn't able to do in text because oh. she couldn't write and people were often either mm -hmm. writing over her or writing for her. Her, you know, her biography is mediated, so she's saying it to someone. A lot of things get changed. Her vernacular gets changed. Even her most famous speech is in Southern vernacular, but we now know that that couldn't have been how she sounded because one, she was born in the North and her first language was Dutch. So she had a very particular sound that was not what is reflected in the historical document. Mm -hmm. And so for me, these poems that I'm kind of writing towards and using her photographs to guide me, I'm interested in what she might have wanted to say that she couldn't say. Well, that's very exciting. I, yeah. I, I can't wait to, you know, <laughs> we see the, you know, the, the finished product of this. Totally. There was uh, something that I read, that, and this is kind of, kind of different, but it's still the same. Um, you, you, I, I saw um, a video of a poem that you uh, read called Elegance Refusal. And it was a particular remark that you made about black women, uh, and, and the state was use beauty aesthetics to ask the world to see uh, them, recreate the visions of themselves as themselves. Mm. Can you kind of expand on that a little bit? Because yeah. it's very interesting. Um, perspective. Definitely. Um, the poem kind of emerged from many places. Um, at the time I was like studying abroad in Paris and I was working with um, African diasporic people in Paris. I was shooting a mini documentary mm -hmm. um, about sort of like blackness, perceptions of blackness and black identity in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, and I came across this Coco Chanel quote that was oh. essentially elegance is refusal. Um, and I was thinking about that in terms of the way that black women and black femmes um, have used sort of like beauty as a way to sort of um, embody that kind of refusal, um, whether that is like through like hair practices or dress um, and just seeing the way that like our hair is so much more than just like, um, like apparel or beauty, but that it's also sort of like this remnant of like this historical remnant. Mm. Um, and I was interested in kind of, I guess, exploring that through that poem mm -hmm. um, and thinking about the ways that like beauty allows us to like be whole and to mm -hmm. be connected to those mm -hmm. before us. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Octavia, do you mm -hmm. have um, work that's coming out or is a collection that you're working on the present? Well, time? yeah, I have a, a new collection out called Praise Songs for the Grave Diggers, oh. and that's currently out. Um, and I'm, I'm excited about, um, Can you tell the, us a little something about that? Yeah, yeah, well, it's kind of like, it's kind of like twofold. Um, of course you're going to read some. Yeah, I'm going to so, read some okay. a, a little bit later, but for the longest time, my writing has really been informed by my, my years in Africa, even prior to being in the Ivory Coast, I was in the Southern part, Eastern part. So a lot of my writing was focused on that. Um, but of late, I say in the past three or four years, I'm writing more, um, frequently about um, the, my students and the children of my lives, be, especially because you see the impact of our political climate on them. Mm -hmm. You see it at, a, at its raw state, whether it's a kid worrying about right. their parent, um, you know, their uh, immigration status, or, um, you know, we've had a, a few uh, children from Syria who visited um, our school for a period of time with, while a sibling was um, being cared for at CHOP. But, but that child was uh, in trauma, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. how that manifests, you know, in the classroom. So mm -hmm. it's, so more frequently I'm feeling compelled. I still have this like sort of international bent, but, the, right. it, but it's at home because it's, it's here, yeah. you know, it's here. You're kind of out there really at the epicenter of a lot that's happening in urban America. Like, you know, statistics I talked to you yeah. about that you see now of the, I, I was really flabbergasted, the number of, students, and I'm talking about high school students yes. and, and, and middle school what, uh, that are homeless yeah. in the United States yeah. and how it is, you know, really ballooned, but I, I, you must face yes, that also most definitely. to a certain, yes. certain extent. Yeah, and yeah. our school feeds somewhat from that community, uh, yeah. Well, we, we, uh, as I said, we have a limited time, yeah. Yeah. and I think we could talk, we use this, mm -hmm. we go on for a couple <laughs> hours. 
But uh, we're also interested in hearing your poems. So um, we can start with you, okay. Octavia. All right. And um, we have a whole half hour, 25 minutes, a half an hour. So okay. take your time and Alrighty. share your, your, your art with us. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, start with the newest piece I worked on um, uh, called uh, Aleppo Runs the Hall. There, um, there's always some kids running up and down the hall, being kind of destructive. But I'm always curious. They're not necessarily my students, but I'm always curious, especially these set of boys, like kind of who they were, the rapport they had. They weren't communicating mm -hmm. um, in, in English. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was just curious as to why they were behaving the way they were. Mm -hmm. Aleppo runs the hall. Aleppo now runs a West Philadelphia school hall, an open channel of enameled stone, a gateway to deliverance, a hallway decorated in the celebratory pillage of Indian headdress and black buckled hats in the middle of autumn's bloom. He rams with boyish rage powered by fluorescent lights and airstrikes of cemented erasure through this cancer tale of thanks to expel an Arabic and newly minted curses, Lancaster Avenue bottom style of his own tale of proxy wars, of armed pilgrims, of slain empires. Seizing the hand of his newest comrade, a boy, brown and homeless, long destroyed by his city too. They rush the hall and self-destruction because to walk with measure would bring no relief. Mm. Um, one, um, at the close of one school year, we had the, um, massacre in Charleston, South Carolina. And I had, again, another third grade class, and we were sharing at the, uh, end of the year, um, what we would be doing for the summer. And one little girl had shared that she was going to, um, she would be hiding for the summer. And I thought, wow, I mean, that's, that was pretty kind of profound because she was really, struck by what had happened, um, uh, particularly in Charleston with the, with the children that were, um, that were, that were uh, there in that church. She actually said I was gonna play dead for the summer. And this is the title, Playing Dead for the Summer. Yeah. Bashira announced on the last day of school with the calmness of the perpetual, perpetually battered, unaware of what blow took her down. She had set aflame her replica of Denmark Vesey's church, made for a third grade school project, made from Marshall's discounted clay, enlivened by the history of her own saliva. She had had daymares wrapped in honeysuckle and lavender of that little Charleston girl with the same corn rolled pattern of hair as she, lying on Vesey's church floor, face down, hoisted by her own wits playing dead to stay alive. Bashira said she would play dead for the summer, hide in the lushness of her grandmother's backyard, gated with bars of rotted wrought iron, and wait with the watermelons and the patty pan squash and sprigs of mint and black eyed Susans on the lookout for this hunting season to pass. Mm. Um, Sojourner was sharing uh, uh, earlier about uh, the reception she initially would re uh, had received when she would go to um, school here in her traditional garb, and you know she spoke several languages, and just the reaction that children had had. And one day she came home kind of frustrated, and I wrote this poem um, in response to that. It's called Victory Threads. I heard her friends laugh at her, that laugh which is square, that stops at points, never to wonder, only to breathe in base expulsions of incurious air. She had proclaimed in a com combined fit of wistfulness and swaggering insolence. She had had combs in Abidjan with names, a Kisi, a U, a Bla, a Ma, a Jua, who understood the temperament of each day's hair story, who could dress your head while weaving choruses of victory threads in your brain preparing you to meet the day haughty and wholly armored. And uh, 
I remember uh, coming to school one day after Gabby Douglas had uh, came on the scene. You know, it, she might have, it was an event that was uh, televised. And that next Monday, kids were just, you know, f doing flips and all kinds of things in the schoolyard. And um, I was kind of moved by them being moved by Gabby. So it was called, this is called a poem for Gabby. On Monday, the schoolyard swelled with hysterical enterprise spawned by you. Limbs long, root-like, a kaleidoscope of browns catapulted by your example, depaved belligerent asphalt. Their mounts and dismounts forge new green belts, four inches wide, flanked by spotters of white sage and fennel. These uniformed girls and boys, abandoned in the bottom of the national vault, broke loose, vaulted high into a humid morning, into a hundred degrees, 180 degrees of protracted splendor. Mm. And um, tell me you, something. Do you, yes. Do, have you ever read your poems to your class? Oh, most definitely. Oh, wow. oh yeah, my stories. <laughs> well, oh, most definitely. Because I always tell them. We are amongst peers with each other. Okay. You know, they, they give That's me wonderful. feedback, I give them feedback. <laughs> yes, most definitely. Um, and I think I'll, I'll end with this poem. Um, I'm really concerned about uh, migrations and movements, and I'm curious about why people move and for what reasons. And I'm really um, incensed that people aren't more um, enraged about what's happening with these crossings over from North Africa over, you know, crossing the Mediterranean into Europe, and thousands of people are dying. And we, and it's a lot of, it's, it's because of colonial policies, U.S. policies, failed policies in these areas that are pushing these people out. Anyway, um, this poem is called Preparations for the Voyage to Lampedusa. Lampedusa is Ital this Italian island that's the destination for a lot of um, migrants who are coming. I don't want to call them migrants. I mean. They're people. They're people, people who are fleeing um, horrors, and they're crossing through the Sahara Desert, through the forests of the North, North Africa, and trying to make it crossing the, uh, the Mediterranean. And here is a woman who um, is preparing her lover's body for this crossing. I tagged him like a suitcase, and our wedding henna and the indigo of our gods so salt and sand could not erase him. Using a hand-rolled cone of discarded plastic, I labeled him in Arabic on his forehead with the translated love poems of Rumi. Riding across the arch of each eyebrow, I braided his eyelashes into a wind rose to inform a faltering will where grace blew the hardest. I pierced his ears with Voltaire's call to give ourselves the gift of living well. On the palms of his hands, I rendered in sloppy English the poetry of Lord and Knight. Between the nervous Dogon mass that dressed his breast and the hairy lotus flowers that framed a navel I loved to get lost in, I sung in the double swirl of earth's only color, a plea in Italian to be kind. Amid the spiring canals of Sundiata's praise song that ran up and down his legs, front and back, I marked the empty spaces with the tattooed faces <coughs> of his children and a P.O. box leading back to Kalakani. On his stained fingernails, I wrote our love dreams, you know, a quarter-filled belly of lamb and hibiscus, a muted chest, feces that is thick and whole and free of the world's disdain, a means of stretching our children with ideas. I wrote this in Bambara because it glows in the dark, because it can lift a diminishing resolve from the clutches of a cold night desert and even dance on death's imminent arrival in the middle of a beautiful sea that will reject him, disguised as a lullaby, to remind him at the moment He's embraced in a wet, frothy death hug. That this failure is not his. It is not his. It belongs to those who will rescue his body. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Thank wow. you. And that, uh, that, that, the title of that book again is? It's called Praise Song for the uh, Grave Diggers. Okay, and who is the publisher? 
I'm the <coughs> Amazon, I publish, okay, self-published. Okay. So can, yes. where can we get a copy? You, you can get a copy on Amazon. Amazon, yes. Great. Well, yeah, fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, so Jenna. Sure. Um, I think I'm going to read from my collection, Reporting from the Belly of the Night. Um, I'm going to begin with a poem entitled, Song of Myself. Before Sojourner Truth escaped enslavement, she was known as Isabella Bumfrey, the name given to Sojourner by her master. Sojourner Salil. On days I need my therapist, I want you before you named yourself, your palms the color of a raw peach, you knowing pain, Isabella. In a dream I can see a photograph of me, my face black, blue-lipped, shining like a moon, so many flowers brimming from the top of a vase that must be abundance in the corner. I plant this song of myself inside of me, inside of you. Sojourner Salil. Ain't no song of myself like me in the swimming pool last summer. The water returning me to the beginning, my hair shrunken with the weight of so much water, chlorine, the neighborhood girl's saliva. I wonder who you'd become in water. Isabella. My mouth is water, this body and how it came to be here, water, how I speak a word in Dutch runs off my tongue like water, flooding every other language that may pulse inside of me, my running be river bed wet with desire. Sojourner Salil. You want America to want you back, and I want a boy who doesn't want me, so desire is always an American thing. I look at your photographs, your face black like my face, meaning you got a pool of what could only be moonlight waiting on your face, and I want you, so I want me. This next piece is called Domi. Um, it came from some of the experiences that I had in Paris, um, kind of communing with and talking with Afro-French citizens. Um, and this poem is for my friend Dominique <clears throat> Domi was born in the French countryside. When she smiles somewhere, a window opens. A black woman shines her teeth. A shirtless black boy's back glitters in the sun. Domi is still looking for love. Domi would really like a daughter. Domi's headed to a roof deck bar by the river and has asked me to come. Domi laughs like she still knows her child self. She laughs and I can see the back of her red mouth. She laughs and there's a river in her eyes. Domi says she's a Parisian girl. Domi is also from the white country children who would throw rocks at her. Domi is also from throwing the rock back. Domi is also from the relentless brown of her body. Domi says, let's go dancing, let's go out. Domi says, let's get out of the city to London maybe. And I think black people must always be leaving, moving. And I think what a wonder we get to choose this time. My last night in Paris were in Montmartre for dinner and the waiter addresses Domi in English first. So Domi says, non, je pas français, which is to say you will not speak me out of home. You crossed an ocean so my red mouth could speak a stranger's tongue. And my parents crossed the ocean back, looking for work, after the spilled blood, after my ancestors were born from the belly of a slave ship, so I could be born here, in our country. Domi takes my hand in Parc Bercy, and we walk over a bridge that hangs over a major boulevard. And for a whole minute, it feels like we are walking over all the cars, all the people, two black girls walking over all of France, so graceful like we're not even angry, so graceful like you couldn't catch the river in our eyes. Domi is reborn out of the French countryside. When she laughs, it's for all our ancestors, for all our boat people, for the crack in her face where the white country children threw the rock. When she laughs, it's for the light that seeps into the wound each day. Domi is still looking for love. Domi says, let's go out, let's go dancing, let's get out of the city, to Venus maybe, or Mars. Domi is headed to another planet. Mm -hmm. um. <clears throat> this one is called A History. Verse, from the Latin word vertere, to turn, as a plowman would a field. Poem, all the lines on the page look like a ripe black field. Poem, from the Greek word poen, to make, 
like a slave woman's bright black hand made a field today, caught and swelling from the ground, white and disease-like. And today, I am dreaming up her body on the phone with the health insurance company in the waiting room on my back at the gynecologist as he bends and looks up my gown, because memory is a hole to look into, because in 1845, a white man looked up into a black hole, a black woman's anatomy spread out like a nation, like the evening sky, and he shifted a slave woman's uterus out of place without consent, without promising her no pain, field, a thing grown for consumption. A white uterus swells back into place like honeysuckle. What was black and experiment is now garden pulsing with snow. Mm. This one's from my friend, Shimalure. It's called Ghost. Who is that again? Your friend? My friend? Yeah, okay. Shimalure. Yeah, okay. we went to school together. California's first rain in months and two black girls biking down the wet earth. Shemilore carries knuck if you buck on her tongue the whole ride. Says black people like rap so much because it is release. Sometimes the beat falls from our black mouths like a howl, the pink of our tongues blooming in a dark room where no one thought it would. And how we open a wound and make garden out of it, how we part the sea with our teeth, where an ancestor might have jumped from a ship into, how we do it with language, and the ocean salt stains our words white. Ghost me this way, with our music keeping us closer than the way they packed us on ships, with my mouth perpetually open like a wet rose, songing a scream, with my hair plaited and greased down by grandma's hands, with the magnolia always in bloom like grandma's hands, as she plucked cotton from the root in her youth, or mended a shirt, a wound on my leg, as she turned the steering wheel and drove aimlessly for hours, for all the time women like her were refused mobility. Grandma presses a foot to the gas and a slave girl comes alive inside of her, trying to move, wanting to be so close to us. And Shemalori's voice is somewhere in that in-between, the lyric cutting itself in half to cut across time like a wet blade and California turning two black girls into water, our shirts sticking to our backs so close to us, we want to be so close to us. We have more time, so if you want to read some more, and both of you, feel free to do it. We have enough time, <clears throat> looking at the clock, to sure. be able to read a couple more poems. You want to. Okay. Do you want to read yeah. some more? Okay. Yeah. yeah. You can um, go back. Yeah. Let's see here. Uh, this, is, um, this is a poem that I, um, I wrote in, um, in honor of Sonia Sanchez, and it was included in... Um, uh, Moonstone's um, honorary uh, collection. Mm -hmm. It's called Ode to, a, to an Ordained Stutterer for Sonia Sanchez. Ancestral midwives induced a prolonged, unsparing delivery of your words, of the progeny spawn from the left of your imagination. Words too intrepid to announce themselves into the soft, lumpy arms of prosody. Words too exacting to be unbraided into the lushness of small talk. Seditious words too extravagant to roll with ease off a tongue unless with fighting gloves. These sage femmes saw the feet of your ideas first, toe-tied, luminous, promising a packed kick, holy, and in the wisdom of their birthing protocol informed by the cravings of warrior girls on the move, without shields and charms, crisscrossing landscapes choked in bereavement. Your words were pulled with delicate intent. So when they arrive to meet the world, clinging to afterbirth and relief and pummeled alliteration, holy bloomed, your words were ready to take aim. I'll share, um, this is a, a poem I wrote in honor of my mom. What remains, her memory, a soup of evaporating dissidents, had survivors, gentlemen with brogues, mouthing all kinds of blues, Yates and lots of Langston. <laughs> Sidorno, did you want to share something? Yeah. Um, 
This is the poem, um, Elegance Slash Refusal, that we spoke about earlier. After Coco Chanel, Patricia Smith, and my cornrows. One, elegance like so much refusal, like my cornrows so tight they should bleed red, but nah. Today I practice grace and swallow Tylenol without water and resist sleeping on the back of my head. Today my hair six inches longer than yesterday and that is refusal, the will to tend a garden out of my head. Today I wrap a headscarf round my braids and that is refusal, like beauty is a thing to be preserved in silk. Enslaved women tied their hair up for centuries and lasted. How long will my hair last? How long should I keep it in two? Today the black gap in between each braid is a street I drive through in the hood. Me and grandma on the way to the hair salon, speeding in her Lincoln town car so elegant as we pass Mary's garden and the white folks outside the meth clinic on Fairmount, the bodegas bursting with new language as Dominicans reach for Spanish words to greet black folk and they, perhaps out of love and perhaps out of habit, grow Spanish tongues and speak the new names back and the neighborhood becomes a kind of refusal, something to drive through until we reach Miss Sherry's beauty salon. Three, Miss Cherry spread my child net across the swan white sink as she washed my hair, spread it so acute like, so fierce as a cut like, black girls have memories of water as both grief and the split of the neck bone and the desire to be clean, to leave the hair salon a wholly new thing. An elegance like I got you so confused cause I've been through six different hairstyles in the last four days. Elegance like allow me to rebirth myself with the ease of several packs of Kinecolon, a hot combs, black sizzle, black hands of a woman. Black woman be the only living thing who done reached for me. That perpetual gesture to refuse the world's almost reach. Then it's caving in. Mm. We have enough time for another one, another one yeah? Sure. Um, <coughs> this one is called, oh, excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Um, this one is called Queen Poku. Um, the group that I am, that my father is from, he's indigenous to the Ivory Coast, um, and he's ballet. And there's sort of like this origin story about how the ballet came to be in um, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and there was this queen, Poku, who was fleeing Ghana, fleeing Ghana with her people, and they had to cross this river. And there was this crocodile that's essentially like, you have to give me your most prized possession if you want to make it out of here, um, and not essentially be killed by the people you're running away from. And they're throwing all these things into the river, gold, treasures, and it's not working. And suddenly she realizes she has to give up her son. And um, Baule translates to give me your child. Mm. And so it's the sacrifice that she has to make as a mother to be a leader of like these, her people. Um, so this poem came out of that place. It's called Queen Poku. When Queen Poku fled Ghana, the mouth of the Komoe River opened to say, give me your child. The choice between nation and son so close you could see the river's rage shining a deep black blue the color of Poku's womb when her child escaped her. The story goes so many ways, you could say it escapes time. After Queen Poku fled her son, fed her son to the river, the backs of pink hippopotamus rose for her people to cross. Some say she swallowed them across, some say she followed them across the river. Some say she jumped into the water, morphing into a fish woman, breathing water into her son's lungs so he could live a new wet life. In a swimming pool on the other side of the world, Poku wraps her new body around me, calls me the little blue girl, her words full of chlorine and the song of a child's voice. I don't want her name for me, nor the water she bring. I want land black folks tended to for centuries. I want feet. In the hood, I come to the pool to cool off, to undo my hair. I fear the deep end, cause I ain't tall yet, and my feet slip at the bottom. I tell Poku that water be so much pain for me. She laughs, but there is no sound. A bubble escapes from the back of her throat, floats up into a filly sky, becomes light, then vanishes. Mm. Yeah. We have time for one. Can you give us one more? Can we? Oh, me? Yeah, sure. It's up to you. Yeah. Do you want to do one uh, last okay. one? Yeah, you, right. you should take us okay. off. Yeah. All right. I'll take, yeah. I'll take you off with, um, mm -hmm. oh, gosh. 
with, um, how about, what we wish, 19? Five? Okay. Five. All right, okay. You're good. Yep, okay, what we wish. So if you're talking about naming and how we name things. Um, my husband, um, in his culture, kids are named after the days of the week, and kids always get a traditional name. It was a big um, back and forth about what we're going to name Sojourner, but I wanted Sojourner, and <laughs> that's a story in itself with the family. What we wish, we decided on Sojourner. Don't confine her to the day of the week or give her the burdens of a childless queen rescued by cro crocodiles. A goose said names could slide you into a destiny. Choose with abandon then, void with the well wishes of rejected sages, a name for our new baby girl, one that lets her raise herself from denial's pit, free from the weight of having birthed the world. Even against the counsel of tradition, in the face of greedy censure, mask and ancient, hungry to consume light, he wanted to take a chance as much for himself as for you, to place you in a basket, swaddled in a name, bound in our faith that you would float into a grand adventure. So we gave you to Isabella, coal black, six feet, steaming in her own appetites because she staked a claim on self hoisted by the gravity of her own cravings to announce her arrival. And that is what we wish for you, a bodacious declaration of self, because armed with this, you can traverse the world in love. Wow, that, mm. that, that's gorgeous. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you very much. For oh, this thank has you. Been yes, a, thank this you is a wonderful us. program. And uh, this so. really shows, <clears throat> you know, the rich, richness and the treasures of the city of Philadelphia as far as our poets. So everything we talk about, mm -hmm. the rich culture, you really exemplify it. I just wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. you know, as we're closing, what's next for Sojourner? What are you, where are you? I saw a little sort of something about film. You're interested <laughs> in film? Yes, yeah. yeah, I'm interested in screenwriting. Um, mm -hmm. I'm currently writing um, a series right now with another like friend uh -huh. who's a screenwriter as well. Wonderful. Um, yes, interested Exciting. in seeing film, yeah. Well, I want to thank you again. Thank I want you. to say to our audience out there, you know, we, we show you the, all the love, for Philly, how Philly loves poetry. We're just asking you to give us some love back. Thank you. Uh, you know, we do uh, 85 poetry readings a, a year. And I, I mentioned mm -hmm. a, an event that Larry is pulling together that'll come out in August. Uh, and you know, we need your support to make that happen. So if you're really interested in making a donation and giving us something, just go to moonstoneartcenterinc.org and uh, show your support for us. It show your support for poetry in the city of Philadelphia, these wonderful poets that we have here, and you know the effort that is put in to bring this all to you. So I thank you very thank much. You. I, thank of course, you very always much. thank the the crew from That's Philly great. Cam who always mm -hmm. does an outstanding job in making this mm -hmm. happening. Thank you. Thank okay. you. It's a pleasure.